Thank you very much indeed, um, Pam, for that introduction and to Janet. And thank you to you all here for your invitation to uh, speak to you this morning. It's a, <clears throat> it's a real honor for me to be in Alberta and sharing the UK experience around public engagement and uh, public involvement. And I'm looking forward to learning an awful lot from you as well. I already have in the short time I've uh, been here. My, my mind is full of ideas and interesting ways in which we might begin to go in the UK with our, with our work. <clears throat> so just to, uh, just to build on that very nice uh, bio that Pam gave me uh, in terms of her introduction, um, a couple of things that it, uh, I think one of the common themes in my life, apart, apart from being part of working for with organizations that are about putting the patient or the public at the center of what they do and what uh, we do around policy is uh, being a campaigner. So uh, that's really my profession. And that's where this picture from that you might have seen that I'm going to take home and show my mum, obviously. Um, <laughs> That's where that picture comes from, which is about three, three years ago when we were going through our, f our first round of spending cuts in the United Kingdom. And there was a campaign called Science is Vital, uh, which brought together uh, patients, patient groups, and science organizations to lobby hard for a good settlement in that budget round for science. And actually, we did uh, very well, comparatively speaking, to to any other. So I'm passionate about campaigning. I'm passionate about what science and research can do uh, for people's lives um, and with people. But I'm passionate about the need to do that uh, in partnership um, with uh, patients and the public. <clears throat> and if I had a, a quote that I would stand by, um, it would be this quote from Shakespeare um, from the Comedy of Errors, which I love. And I think it speaks very much to the, what we're trying to do, which is to go um, hand in hand, not one before uh, the other, in terms of forwarding research of and for patient uh, benefit. Uh, and that's <clears throat> William Shakespeare in the corner. It's not my dad. Um, well, they do, they do have an uncanny likeness at times. So um, I, I saw a clue in the title of your, your, your uh, series when it said policy. So I've started off my talk. Uh, uh, I'm going to start off my talk talking about the policy environment first, because I think it's quite important that you understand the context within which we're working in the UK, because I think it's a very positive one, um, and I think uh, for the first time in my life around this issue, I can really feel um, a real tailwind behind what we're trying to achieve. Um, I'm actually going to start in the middle of the story, and that will make sense to you a bit later, but um, it was very interesting um, towards the end of 2011 um, that as part of our country's approach to dealing with austerity, um, which in the health world we call health and wealth, so the mantra from uh, ministers downwards, number 10 downwards, number 10 Downing Street being the, the home of the Prime Minister, Office of the Prime Minister downwards, is uh, everything has got to be about building the health and the wealth of the nation. It was interesting that in that context, when the government published its life sciences strategy, which, is, which it's, it was its first um, push around what life sciences might do to build health and wealth, um, the Prime Minister got on the podium and in a context about, of uh, encouraging an approach where we uh, uh, persuade people about the need to share their data for research purposes, their, their medical records. <clears throat> he used this phrase, we want every patient to be a research patient. And I don't think probably he or his advisors quite recognized the significance in that few short words about what that meant in terms of opening up the game very widely for engagement involvement, but also um, how far we hadn't come. And you'll see that a lot in uh, times in my presentation, I'm using the word citizen quite deliberately because to deference to what I've read a little bit about the fact that you quite like the word citizen. It's my favorite term, if I'm honest, um, because uh, if you go back to the origins of the word citizen, it means membership of the community. And I think what this is about, this agenda is about, is about making patients and the public members of the research community and full participants in that. But anyway, what, what does that mean? And you'll know as policymakers, people interested in policy, 
that language and tone and style is extraordinarily important. We pore over it day after day to look for the merest indication of what's coming next, of how things might be changing or not changing. And for us, I think that was quite a significant moment. And it's, been, it's given us a, an anchor on which I think to um, weigh quite a lot of our work around why public involvement um, is important. So there's the pure sort of, if you like, generation of growth aspect of increasing the opportunity for people to actually to take part in trials and clinical studies, building the amount of research we do, maintaining the UK leadership in, in clinical research. That's one very dry aspect, but it's also one around um, uh, by involving uh, citizens, you increase the relevance and the value and the efficiency and the impact of what we're doing. You generate a much more smoothly running uh, machine around research, it would be the argument, around the health and wealth agenda uh, on public involvement, than if you do not do that. And I think that's been given further emphasis in the last uh, six months or so, where we've had a series of reports about the health service in general and, and what's been going on in our health service, which has been a tragedy, to put it mildly, which has also increased the neurosis of government around health about its lack of accountability to the public and the need to improve accountability mechanisms. So these things in a policy environment have really combined, I think, to, to, to create that tailwind, which I think is very important. So the life sciences strategy is part of a series of uh, uh, legislatively, legislative policy and sort of language and practice changes that uh, have go, uh, uh, come together really to encourage this sort of uh, renewed focus, this renewed energy, this repurposing, if you like, around public involvement, citizen involvement in terms of health research specifically. These are just some of the, um, uh, just some of the sort of uh, documents that um, lay out what the future should be from a patient and public perspective. Um, and I'm going to come go through some of these, uh, not the documents itself, but what they actually mean. But you'll see uh, the quote from Sir Malcolm Grant, who's, who's um, one of the key figures in our new NHS, our NHS commissioning board, about patient experience. The mantra is around improving the patient experience. That's everywhere you go, people are using that word. I don't think we quite understand what we mean by it, generally, in policy terms, as is often the case. But it's nonetheless uh, something that we are using, I am using, in quite a Machiavellian uh, way, to be honest, and I think, well, I think there's no shame in doing that. Um, so we have an encouraging framework. And uh, one important aspect that's driven from that is the fact that our NHS now has a uh, cast iron duty to advance and promote research as part of its uh, uh, day, to work, day work, and that within that, uh, part of that uh, remit is now to increase the opportunities for people who are using the health service to take part in uh, take part in research. So my national director role is really about working with the NHS to make that happen. <clears throat> and we've been spending the last 18 months in a dialogue with stakeholders and others and, uh, to create a program, a strategy to begin to build that because it's going to take time. This is a, a 5, 10, 15 year project. It's not something that just happens uh, overnight. Um, and we have five um, distinct um, pillars. We have uh, one which is about providing people, both patients but also clinicians and health professionals, with the right information and tools which support an informed choice to take part or not to take part in, in research. We have a second pillar which is around uh, encouraging um, use of digital and online and social media. Uh, we're particularly interested in the way that people might be able to use that to self-direct their own uh, involvement in research as part of their uh, care and treatment. We're driving a program and approach which is about encouraging patient leadership in different contexts. So particularly at the moment within our hospitals, people who can have a lived experience um, uh, of a particular condition, but not always, who can work alongside clinicians and researchers to uh, make the environment, that hospital environment, such that research is more visible and people understand it's part of what that hospital does with them as part of their care and treatment. 
The fourth one is around recognising and refining models around public involvement that really give efficient delivery around clinical trials, and I'm going to come back to this. But we've had a six years of letting many flowers bloom across our clinical research networks, and that's great. But we now have to do, I think, a little bit of weeding, a little bit of building flower beds, uh, to do more to help people um, define the sort of seven or eight models, maybe more, maybe less, of public involvement within the clinical trial or clinical study context that really helps to deliver uh, to time and to target. And the last one is using patient experience and insight um, <clears throat> uh, better to improve what we do, but also to improve the offering to patients. Um, and there's a debate when I, when I left the UK, which is all about um, uh, one of our local, um, our national consumer, a new national consumer uh, body for health and social care called Healthwatch. Um, has come out with a, um, a proposal for eight new consumer rights, and there's a big debate about whether consumer is the right word um, to use in the context of health and social care. Personally, I have some problems with it, but I do think that as we ask more people to be part of research, we need to get better at customer service. Uh, the most simple example of that is too often people take part in research and they're not thanked for that participation, their contribution is not acknowledged, and people are not told the results of the study, even in summary form, or find it difficult to access those. And that's a problem, that's a big problem. It's, it's a disincentive that's built into our culture that we need to be watchful for. Um, I'm not gonna go through all this, but we are trying to move, as much as I think um, any controlling government can do, to a point where we, where we want people to drive the system, to help us to explore this ground. I was saying to colleagues yesterday that in research we're probably a little bit fortunate in that our area is quite apolitical, whereas in public involvement, in the uh, citizen involvement, in the service side, it's very, very political for all sorts of good and, uh, good and bad reasons. In our areas, I think we have more space to encourage that sort of self-direction um, of people around what they want to do in research and how they want to contribute. But this is really about people making it happen for themselves and for, uh, for others. So what's the sort of strategic challenge in terms of our population? So um, it's pretty simple actually um, in, in many regards. We have a population that culturally and societally um, uh, feels very warm and fuzzy and cuddly about research. Um, they certainly think the health service should be doing it. They certainly think it should be an opportunity that's presented to them. But when they become a patient because of a diagnosis, their experience is far removed from that expectation. And you'll see here, we, we don't have particularly robust data across our patient populations in the UK. But in some areas like cancer, we do are beginning to have. And you'll see there from our National Cancer Patient Experience Survey, only one in three patients um, have had just as purely a discussion about whether it's possible for them to take part in a, in a trial. And in some areas, like in some conditions like diabetes, it's even worse. So it's for me, the strategic, if I wanted to put it in the most simple terms, it's closing uh, this gap. And we, sh we should be able to do this because if you look at the willingness of people to participate in research, different forms of research, people are really willing to do that. Um, this is from the Association of Medical Research Charities in the UK, um, and this is a Mori poll, um, and it shows people's willingness to share data or take part in trials, and, and generally people are very positive about that, uh, about doing that. It's not to say they don't have concerns and they want clarification, but people are positively disposed to this and see its need. They want to help others as well as seeing its benefits possibly for their own uh, treatment when the time comes. <coughs> Um, but we probably have a root problem as well, um, which is that um, despite that um, despite that general favourable opinion towards research within an NHS context, most people do not feel well informed at all. They don't know what clinical research is, they don't know what other forms of research are, they have a, perhaps a general grasp of, of the fact that it's good and it happens in labs perhaps and um, involves people perhaps and often animals. and. Um, but they don't have a really deep grasp of what it is and where they can play a role in it. Um, and they have a real confident, a confidence issue when we're trying to encourage people to benefit from choice about going to their doctor or their specialist to say, hey, you know, is there, a, is there something out there that I can benefit from? Um, and I think there, for me, there's always a sort of rather cultural um, 
uh, anomaly here, which is, which is I, one day I think I might try and write a book about it, because um, we have lots of people doing this in our country, not necessarily just dressing up as Father Christmas, <laughs> but, um, uh, but actually we have a huge um, a sort of gravitational pull at the moment around supporting charities who fund research. Um, if you look at our own AMRC, uh, Association of Medical Research Charities, and the charities it funds, they contribute over a billion pounds a year to um, uh, medical research of different forms. And the vast majority of that is raised from the British public in one form or another. People who dress up as Father Christmas or as lobsters or, or whatever, as well as doing more, more mundane things. Um, um, and I think probably for a lot of people, there's a real emotional heart thing going on here rather than a rational um, uh, draw to, to science and music. And I think we have to recognize that in terms of our public engagement efforts. I've seen a lot of research organizations go about engagement as if it's about education, educating the illiterate rather than actually saying, what's the dialogue here? Um, why, do people, why are people interested in this? How do I make that connection? And that's what it's really about. It's how do we make that connection with people? And heart's a good thing. So um, let's go on to some of the specifics of the, the UK experience. And I'm going to talk about um, now uh, the involvement of the public in design, um, prioritization, and delivery of research. So I was speaking to a group yesterday, and I said there were four or five reasons why I think we've done well thus far. Not to say that we can't do a lot better, but well thus far. And, that, and the reasons all really orientate around our National Institute for Health Research. It came onto the scene about 2004, 2005. Um, despite being the new kid on the block, it's now uh, got funding of over a billion um, a year, and I think probably um, the most influential part of the system at the moment because of that, but also because of, its, um, because of its leadership. And it was very important in the first days of that organization, it started off with um, public involvement as a core principle of what it's, it was going to do. We are going to do our business, our day-to-day -day business, our strategic thinking with public involvement at the, uh, at the heart of it. And I think that was a very strong, bold, courageous statement. We didn't know what that meant to us in 2004 to five. We didn't have a cast iron plan set out. We just had an instinctive um, sense that this was the right thing to do um, to generate good research, good quality research of patient benefit. The second thing is we had a leadership that was brought into it someone who you will know very well, Dame Sally Davis, is uh, head of our NIHR, and really she's been an incredible champion of public involvement. And she has set the expectation with her leadership team and in all parts of the system uh, that they are to incorporate public involvement. <clears throat> we're also lucky in, I think, that we had my organization involved waiting in the wings with a 10-year history and experience of public involvement that NIHR brought under its wing and began to fund fully uh, on an ongoing basis. And I think that strong platform is important to, to the sustainability of, of any emerging movement. And this is an emerging, emerging movement, public involvement. And I think there were three sort of cultural things that were going on as well. One, we said we would do everything by partnership, uh, partnership between researchers and patients. One, we would set a clear expectation with the community, so anybody who applies for a grant or wants to do a bit of infrastructure or program within NHR, uh, the expectation is that as part of that application process, they have to have a public involvement plan that's reviewed, that's agreed, that's funded uh, before they can go forward. And we put investment behind it. And um, uh, not a lot of investment, I would, I, I would accept that, but we put some investment behind it. And I think that's important. That's an important signal to the community that you mean business. And actually what it means sometimes, it's now playing out in some of the review bodies that I sit on, that public involvement, um, the extent to which it's there and whether it's good quality or not, can be a, either a deal breaker or a marriage break in terms of whether someone's successful with a, their application. And I think that's a very strong statement. It doesn't go down very well sometimes, obviously. Um, who likes to be rejected, but I think it's very important that people know that we are, we mean serious business about this. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk a lot about the mechanics in Vivol. Basically, we are a coordinating center, a small staff, a budget of about well, three, uh, three quarters of a million pounds. Um, we provide leadership across the NIHR. We have a, this is a sort of simplified map of NIHR in the far um, 
uh, your right-hand corner. It's much more complex than that, and we do a lot of fair facilitation across NIHR to ensure a consistent approach to public involvement. We do a lot of uh, gathering evidence um, and building that and bringing together a community of researchers in public involvement so people can look at uh, impact. Um, but a lot of our, our, our work as a body is about developing capacity and capability. Um, and now we have public involvement in terms of uh, people prof professionally doing that job, plus communities and patients in each part of um, in each part of NIHR. So we have a lot to do to help support them, to guide them, to bring issues that are strategic that need attention to the attention of Sally Davis and others on the leadership board. Um, and that's uh, that's our that's our website. But I think one thing I was going to say um, was. Um, uh, about the fact that one sign I think that we are part of a, a growing movement is we've recently redone our website and it's not just down to this but when we recently did it in uh, January 2012 we had about 17,000 hits to our website. This August we had 71,000 hits to our website and I think that's just a sign that there's more interest, uh, more questions, uh, a real fervent, fervent desire to learn more about this, this issue. So we could probably talk for hours about definitions, citizens versus patient versus public, involvement versus participation versus engagement, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I'm very happy to have a dialogue about that. I think language is important. But I do think we get stuck too long on these uh, discussions. My advice to any organization is go for the definition that feels most comfortable for you and stick to it and live through the noise because it never goes away. And quite rightly, we're trying to understand what's going on here. This is, the, this is the definition that we have of public involvement and we use across NIHR. And we deliberately chose one which was about the public, which implied a broad uh, church, which was quite accessible to people, uh, which defined very broadly the many aspects of public involvement that could uh, uh, come under that. Um, so, so I just wanted to share that to you because that's the one that we drive through NIHR. If you, you might go to another part of the research community and you find a slightly different one. So our universities talk about public engagement. They, our universities don't really like letting the public in to actually help them do things, but they will do it one day. Um, and you might go to one of our charities, and again, they'll use a different term. Quite often they'll talk about communications, and bed everything into communications, and that's, sorry if there's any communications people here, is you should never put your public involvement work or its leadership within your communications team for all sorts of reasons I'm happy to go into. Right, so where do we see public involvement um, um, happening? Well, you, some of you may be aware of this paper in The Lancet by Chalmers and uh, Glazou um, about um, uh, their write-up of what they see in terms of the amount of, um, uh, of patient views on what research should be funded. And there's always a big, I think, battle between uh, the patient desire to see more research done in terms of quality, uh, of life issues as opposed to the search and the uh, for new drug treatments. There's always a tension there. And when I go to public meetings, that the question I most often get is, why don't we spend more on the quality of life aspects? And this paper, which was published in The Lancet, uh, basically agrees with that. And we now have a program within NIHR which is looking more intently at that. Um, but we do have now some mechanisms, good mechanisms, be begin to do some research prioritization with patients and the public. Uh, the main mechanism is something we call the James Lind Alliance um, Priority Setting um, Partnerships. And this is the one that was launched about a uh, week before last. Um, and this is a methodology that would bring, bring, brings clinicians, health professionals, and uh, patients together to determine, in the end, 10 or 11 top treatment uncertainties. And then those treatment uncertainties can be ones that that, that organization, Parkinson's UK, or other parts of the research community can begin to use as a guide to what they may fund. And it's interesting to me sitting on panels that I'm seeing a lot more people cite what we call for short JLA uh, PSPs. And I've put a link at the bottom here, because you, you can have these slides afterwards, a link at the bottom here to the JLA uh, page so you can understand a bit more about that. But that's a way of working in partnership to come up with some defined uh, priorities for research. The other one is in terms of just, I think, refining the research and making the research better. We have a very active young persons group um, uh, across our clinical um, research networks. 
And um, both them, but also across some of our other research networks, it's been a coming together, I think, of pharmaceutical companies and patients to design better research protocols, which have then improved um, the efficiency of delivery, particularly around recruitment and clarity of, uh, of information. So that's another key way in which we've seen public involvement happen uh, within terms of uh, clinical trials um, specifically. Um, and we've recently begun to put, I think, some hard numbers about this. So normally, well, in the past, we've been very good at producing sort of case histories, you know, good stories about how people have changed their lives because of it or how we've impacted on, on research. But we are beginning to generate some hard numbers around the evidence now. This was a paper published in the British Journal of Psychiatry um, about three, four weeks ago now, um, and it was a study across our mental health research network. Uh, 345 different studies were looked at, and the basic story behind this is that they found where public involvement was happening throughout the study, it was four times more likely to recruit the patients it needed to target than those that had very minimal amounts of public involvement. So I think that's a very compelling piece of evidence around what public involvement can do uh, for you as a, uh, as a funder. <clears throat> and I just put some facts and figures about relevance, um, reach, and recruitment um, uh, around the public involvement community. I'm not going to go through all these, but I suppose the fourth bullet point is something we're quite proud about, which is that we, in the last year, had 630,000 people going into trials, and that was triple the number of six years ago. And I think that's, one, because of our clinical research networks being set up, but I think part of it is to do with the public involvement component of that um, and making it uh, work more efficiently. I suppose the only one, other one I might mention here is um, one of my key messages, if you are going to do public involvement, you need to fund and support it appropriately. Uh, we don't quite have it right in NIHR at the moment. I'd be absolutely um, straight up with you. Uh, we have a situation where we have pots of gold appearing. So this centre has 10% of its budget going to public involvement. There are a few other places. But in many other places, I see it being completely under, undercut and underfunded. And, and actually, that's a real problem. It's a real problem because it means you're actually not supporting patients of the public to, to come to the table properly and appropriately. So what are some of the other things um, that we're, we're doing in terms of public engagement? So this is the, the first ever national campaign that we carried out um, earlier this year for International Clinical Trials Day in May. It was called OK to Ask. It had a very simple message. It was patient-facing. It was the saying to patients, you know, it's OK for you to ask your clinician about whether there's a trial that you might benefit from. And it was uh, focused on running this through our hospitals, which is the more stable part of our system organizationally at the moment. Um, and we just, it was really a proof of principle campaign. Um, the idea came from patients. We had very little money to put behind it, but we decided that we were going to run with it um, uh, to learn as much as we could. And it was a very popular campaign. Um, some people even took the message to their wedding day, as you can see here, which I think is rather fantastic of them. Um, but we had some amazing feedback about um, the resonance of this within hospitals. So, You'll see the, the second um, feedback from the um, left was that through a follow-up survey, we found that 80% of people said that they found it helped to build momentum behind making their trust more research, trust being a hospital, more research friendly and helped support them in making that uh, happen. Um, and across the NHS, we had 150 plus events. So each event is a single site. So in one hospital, you might have five or six events across different sites. And some people were saying um, the campaign was more high profile and has lasted longer than some of our other really important ones, like um, the washing hands campaign that we've had recently to, to stop um, uh, infection within uh, hospitals. So it's really impacted. So we're going to run it for the next uh, one, two years uh, to give, to embed the message, probably uh, build the message more around clinicians and, and health professionals. Um, the second section is just to talk to you about the digital media strategy. Now, I don't think governments are very good at this, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I might be wrong, but I don't think in the right way to make digital strategies work. Um, and I'm always jealous of how good and how fast and how innovative our 
private sector colleagues are, and indeed patients are. They think far ahead of us. They have far less concerns about risk. And I was just very struck by this quote that I heard from Sam Tier from Harvard University about how actually the public are constantly ahead of the game in the way that we think about this. And I actually think it's quite a struggle for governments and public funders to think where they should work most. Um, we have something called the UK Clinical Trials Gateway. Which is, um, which is where people can theoretically go and find out about research that they can take part in. Um, but, um, and you can, it's a website, um, and it's also a downloadable app. There's one problem with it, or several problems with it. I mean, I think it's great, it's a great innovation, but we've got a lot of work to do on it, and I'm chairing the project board that's leading that. But when we asked the patients and public what they think of it, they said, we love it. But um, it would be really nice if I could know about research that's 10, 20 miles down the road, not something that's in New York, um, which is fair enough. Um, and, um, and the other thing is, actually, they want, there's a very strong impulse coming through. They want to make their own choices about this. So at the moment, the general advice is to people, go to your GP, your primary care physician. I don't think people will want this in 10, 15 years' time. I think they'll want to go direct to their clinical trial site. And that poses all sorts of issues, good and uh, bad, and some ethical ones about how we should do it. But we should certainly help to them to self-direct their own uh, questions and uh, choices going forward. Um, and I often look at some of these other organizations like um, Cystic Fibrosis and Cystic Fibrosis Unite, where they are beginning to develop online platforms of communities of patients who are sharing data, who have put themselves forward, um, who are determining and thinking of their own research ideas to take forward. I think this is the space that's really interesting to me. I think what governments can do is to provide really good broadcast information, really high quality information uh, that others can use and, you, and trust uh, with very little risk. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on, on this slide because I just want to end with a, end with a final message. Um, but we also have something called the NIHR Journals Library. We have a very vociferous debate in the UK. I don't know whether you have it here about people being able to access the reporting of results. And uh, generally, you can't. Um, but all our uh, uh, NIHR research is now published through the Journals Library. And it's a requirement of that that they have to detail what the public involvement was in the study. And I think that's very... Again, it's a, a good little milestone for us to have reached that people are beginning to write up the methodology uh, in their work. Two, three minutes on organizational change. So um, we are beginning to build, um, I think, some very exciting local geographies around <coughs> research, not dissimilar to, I suppose, uh, your provinces and their approach. We have three things that are sort of sliding in, slotting in together. One are our academic health science research networks, which are very like your academic health networks. Um, two, we have our clinical, local clinical research networks, so our national clinical research networks are being divided into uh, 15 local clinical research networks. And then we also have our CLARCs, which are collaborations um, uh, for leadership in applied health research and, uh, and care. And these are being separated into 15 patches like this, and I think this has huge potential for connectivity, not just in research terms, but also for public involvement. Public involvement has tended to think within its own boundaries of its organization. And this gives us an opportunity to really connect public involvement and build, I think, what the future is about. And for me, the future is about not public involvement, not participation, not engagement. It's actually about building research active communities as part of driving towards healthier populations. And um, we have beginning to have a taste of that in some of the work around Bradford, which is a, 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 a city in the north of England um, where they have a birth cohort study happening, but they've used it to in, encourage the whole community to be part of and understand the importance of research and what it uh, generates to improve uh, health and wealth in their community. And also things like citizen scientists in Salford, which is about encouraging people and engaging people around a very, very strong science base that they have, again, in the north of the country. So it's about building, I think, um, research active communities where uh, research is visible, um, citizens are involved in um, uh, research prioritization, um, the community helps to shape research questions. Um, they are on the board, they are part of governance and part of the accountability mechanism. They have clear opportunities to participate 
Um, partnership, strong partnership exists within the area and across areas. Um, citizens are co-producing innovation and technology. I haven't talked much about innovation this morning. Um, they have access to and are able to use the evidence really meaningfully in terms of their own care and child treatment. And they can self-direct their level of contribution um, and not to have it determined for themselves. And I'm just going to finish with one last statement, which is actually from our Young People's Advisory Group. You'll see there's this Generation R poster, and this is a big event that we had at our National Science Museum a few weeks ago. There was great discourse between the young people there, and one of them was, um, one of them did a mock weather forecast for public involvement in the UK, which was rather, uh, rather, rather lovely. And um, uh, she said the future was about sunny spells, and I thought that was rather nice. I'm rather realistic. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Simon. We have about 15 minutes for questions, and there's some microphones that are going to be passed around the room. So if you want to ask a question, please put up your hand. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, Verna Yu from AHS. My question for you is, this, is in regards to recruiting patients and actually training patients so that they are informed and able to provide help. So <clears throat> you mean uh, recruiting patients not in terms of a trial itself or research, but actually in terms of your organization? OK, so the how-to, as it were. So I think there are various approaches to this. Um, and um, I'll describe one I think has been a really good model for something I've been involved in. Um, and this was um, our Primary Care Patient Safety Translational Research Centre. Um, they never have short names, these places, do they? Or easy acronyms. I mean, it's horrendous. Um, anyway, this is based in Manchester. Um, and quite a difficult task for them to think about how to bring together um, uh, what they call research, they call them research users there. Um, and so what they did was they knew that they needed a group of people to help them strategically and to begin to populate some of their thematic areas. So um, what they did was they did an open recruitment exercise. So through the local press, um, through their own networks, through social media, through existing patient contacts. I mean, everybody has, despite what you might think sometimes when you're sitting there at 6 o'clock at night struggling with a plan, you will have patient contacts if you think about it. Uh, close enough. So they used their networks and as a result of that they pulled together I think uh, uh, 12 and now 15 um, members of this research users group who come from very different perspectives. Some There's a couple of people with really uh, hardcore lived experience of mental health. Others are real generalists. They've just interested in and they've had an interest in civic service for years. Some people are just very connected to their community. So they now perform that strategic research group. And then you can also, if you're within the population of Manchester in the future, be able to become a friend of the center. And then they were doing little bits of specific recruitment and identification for patients around specific projects and things, which would be the right way to do. So I think it's about really, one, identifying what you need, and two, thinking of the right, as in, I suppose, um, policy itself, thinking of the right strategy for that. Um, I think those sorts of open models are the ones I favor, as opposed to what can happen, which is, I know those people, I'm going to get those. Because actually, you don't begin, you don't get a fresh view. You're not really doing public involvement. That's not to say those people aren't good, but you're not actually, you're not creating an environment or a mechanism for challenge, which is what you want. You want them, those people to be there to challenge you in the same way that you would want accountants or auditors to challenge you for what you're doing. And I think that's probably the, more or less the model I like most. Thank you, Simon, for the excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about university being, universities being reluctant to be involved in patient or to involve patients. Why do you think that is the case? Well, I think um, because they've not had a core principle around seeing the public as part of their community. Um, 
Um, I am involved at the moment in a, in a huge push the universities are doing called um, Engaged Futures in the, in the UK, which is a sort of consultation exercise about how do they improve the relationship with, patient, well, with the public, not because, of course, it will be not necessarily patients. Um, and there is, I think, a very embedded culture in the academic institutions that I work with, which is that the people are there to be educated. Um, there, isn't there, there isn't supposed to be a dialogue. We don't need them to be involved in how we run the shop. And I think that's a, I think that's a real missed opportunity. But I think people are beginning to change that view. One of the reasons, and we haven't talked much in policy terms about carrots and sticks, but one of the reasons is that we have a, a new system by which universities are being graded according, and, and therefore funding will be based around, although there isn't in theory, a link between those two things. Um, and uh, that's called the Research Excellence Framework. And as part of that, 25% of the, uh, the rating is based on their impact on users. And that impact can be defined in many ways by uh, universities. But a lot of them are having to really think hard because a lot of them are coming up with impact, which is actually one-way engagement. And I know that my colleagues from a public involvement point of view who will be sitting on those panels, which is a great thing, will actually be saying to their colleagues around the table, that's not really, that's not really involvement, that's not impact. That, all they've shown is 20,000 people walk through their door to see an exhibition. But you don't know if they took any knowledge away with them or whether you engaged them in a discourse. So I think we will begin to see some change around that. fabulous presentation. Um, I'm just curious because Dame Sally was actually here a year ago and she presented and it was it was my understanding that in the UK, compared to Canada anyway, public involvement has been a little bit more integrated with research comparatively for some time. But, but her observation was that um, standardizing healthcare was sort of the goal and it wasn't necessarily standardizing health outcomes that we needed to have this shift towards improved overall health, and that the patients previously had been identified quality of life markers, that which may or may not translate into overall health outcomes mm -hmm. or improvements. So when you were speaking today, your very first slide showed, like from 2012 to 2013, it showed, a, I think, an improvement in and domestic product, like gross domestic product. Which but maybe I completely made up. Okay. <laughs> but, but I'm looking for evidence, right? Like improving capacity or improving recruitment for research trials that are more, you know, focused on, on quality of life or have the patient perspective involved. Where's the evidence that that improves overall health outcomes or, or health spending? That's what I'm after. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a very good question, and I would say the evidence for that is slim, and I think that we are, to some extent, going on gut instincts. But I would present two things for you, or encourage you to look at it, or, in, or, or do your inquiry around it in two ways. One is we already know that the burden of illness of particular conditions is huge. So if you look at dementia, for instance, where we have a national prime minister-led challenge around dementia, the cost, the yearly cost, to the nation is in billions. So it makes sense um, that if you produce research, not just in terms of treatments, but in terms of improved quality of life that reduces the amount of dependence on the state, then you are going to help that figure come down. I think the other one is that if you look at those people who are suffering from chronic illness or disability or mental health conditions, that if you look at the way that they're currently treated, they're not treated in such a way and supported in such a way that the objective is to get them, for instance, back to work, would be an example, or back into the community in whichever way that want. So again, you have a dependence there that doesn't make any sense at all, either from their own personal health uh, issues and personal determination, but also from an economic point of view. So again, it makes sense that if you're driving research to answer those questions, to enable people to be 
playing a part in the community they want a part, and public involvement is helping you do that, you have a connection. That's what I would argue. And I would, but I would also absolutely accept that there's quite an emotional argument there as opposed to a, a quantified one. Okay, so sorry, can I ask another question? <laughs> um, I have seen some evidence be generated that is, uh, that has public, it's public, informed by the public. They can demonstrate a decreased health spending or an overall decrease in burden for a, a specific chronic disease or, you know, so that evidence exists. But there's a systematic issue because if you keep these people out of emergency, the people that you turned away today are now in today. So actually this, and I've actually seen some evidence that if you keep them out the system or you move them through the system more quickly, it actually costs the system more <laughs> because it became more efficient. Um, so. Like even if we do all this work and we fix these, you know, you have your, ta your target t topics or chronic diseases, what happens to that revolving door? Well, because the reason why that happens is because we tend to look at the way that we care for and treat people from the system's point of view and not from the person's point of view. So, so we, we, and what we have a problem, I don't know whether it's the same here, in the UK we have a problem in that because things aren't integrated very well, social care, acute care, uh, primary care, whatever you call it, then we tend to, thought, to think about solutions in terms of each of those remits rather than what, what, what happens between those. But from a patient perspective, what they need, the first point that they go in to care in terms of their own pathway, what are their concerns, what are their priorities? So our primary care is probably very good at dealing with a certain set of problems, but isn't really paying due attention to what that might mean for acute care physicians, for instance and vice versa, and the handoff isn't good. So I would argue, uh, yes, that probably does happen now, and there is evidence to suggest it happens, but that's because we don't, as a mindset, look at it through the patient perspective. We look at it through our policymaker, our system uh, way. Um, thank you for your talk. I'm a junior researcher in the health science uh, discipline. I have uh, three questions for you. The first question is, uh, when you talk about um, involving uh, patients, are you trying to promote participants to, it is a multiple choice question, A, <laughs> generate new ideas for future researcher? Uh, B, B uh, trying to um, like uh, suggest the patients to be a participant of the testing, um, of within the testing population of the research, or C, engage in the development and refine of a protocol of a re actual research, D, supervise or management, um, management of the po clinical process, or E, suggest ref uh, reform, uh, change, or amendment to a research after its data collection. Or are you trying to promote the patients to do all of this, to engage in all of this? So I would say all of the above. <laughs> um, but I would say that for an organization, any organization, you have, a, you, don't, you have a finite amount of resources, you have a finite capability to uh, promote public involvement at any given time. I absolutely accept that. So clearly you want people involved in all those things and for there to be knock-on benefits from those. But you have to perhaps prioritise. So when NIHR started, uh, when I talked about our core principle, our starting point was really about to um, improve the public involvement of, in the process of um, uh, research application uh, award and funding. So the process by which we decided what we were going to fund and how we were going to fund and what it would look like. So that was the starting point, really, from within NIHR. And then we've begun to grow outwards and begin to encompass these other things. So the James Lind Alliance, the priority setting mechanism, that was actually an independent initiative from government. It was funded by government a little bit, but it was independent to us. But we've now brought it mainstream within NIHR. Um, and giving it a roof. So it's part of the way that we think partially about priority setting. So I think you have to think, where is it going to most add value at this beginning point or at this five-year point or this 10-year point and begin to work around that? And then you build that confidence around that and you can move to other aspects. But I would say, 
unashamedly all of the above. <laughs> Thank you. And then the second question is, how do you manage the confidentiality of a research that is undergoing? And what about like if their patients generate an idea about a new research, do they own the partnership? Um, no, sorry. Uh, do they own the patent ship? The patent? So um, confidentiality, do you mean in terms of the running of the, running of the trial, if they're on the trial steering group? Do you, is that what you mean, or as a participant? You talked about confidentiality. Well, well, anyway, so I'm on a trial steering committee for something that's to do with a, a personal experience of my, my family. And we're all used to the fact that as lay members of that committee, we sign a confidentiality agreement. It's part of the expectation. And you shouldn't think of it otherwise. I think there's interesting issues that are cropping up in terms of ongoing research with social media that, you know, I do know of instances where people are texting the fact that they're on a trial and that's causing some significant serious issues for the, the, the research and we haven't, we're completely unprepared to know how to de deal with that. Um, yeah, sorry, what was the other part of your question? Confidentiality and... The patent of an idea, like if a... Well, I'd love to think that we'd got any service user who's had an idea that's accepted and funded got to the point where that's the case, and we haven't really. We have some good service user researchers who are now academics themselves, but I was saying yesterday we've done little to support ideas from patients and carers and support them to take it forward as a, as a research idea, even in their own sort of space, as it were, and develop that. But it would be an interesting, it was an interesting question to follow through, which I'm probably too early in the day to begin to think about the IP issues around, around that. I see. And then I have a third question. <laughs> um, for, so I heard about open, res, uh, open source data from clinical research. Like if you uh, collect a, a, a group of data, then other researchers want to assess them and want to, maybe they have um, they have IT professions who can, uh, who can process the data in a different way, and it will be a totally different result, or they will look at a totally different um, perspective. Like how in their, like maybe many of the patients or public, they have their own specialty in IT, in data analyzing. Um, would, would it be a, a direction for people to be able to assess the the clinical data, who, uh, which were locked in a in a private system before, would they be able to assess those data in the future? So that's already happening a little bit in some rare disease areas. You have some very um, mobilised patients who, online within the UK in rare diseases, are actually doing that data interrogation with with researchers, and are actually contributing their own data to the system. So I think. Um, I think you know, you're beginning to see that anyway. I don't think we thought through all the challenges, particularly if you then scale it up to much bigger patient communities and patient populations. Um, that I suppose that's one of the really active areas, not just a policy debate, but also around care and future treatment, is around you create a, a greater system of transparency. Goes to my first pillar, how do you give people the information and the tools to both understand that but also potentially contribute to it themselves. And, um, and I think that's about having a good partnership with patients to devise those models and devise that information um, and to uh, self-direct them. So I was in a few uh, weeks ago, I was with a patient group talking about consent giving, which is slightly different, but there's a message behind it. And we were talking about how to change consent process and the inf information given. And there, and I said to them, well, you know, what, what, how should we do this? And, and they all said, well, I want to know what I want to know. They want to be able to self-direct themselves through the stages of consent uh, and decision-making around that, not be given a 45-page consent form which someone says to them, it's good for you to read this, but they can't make head or tail of them. We've really got to change our approach around these things and understand, as that quote says, that people are becoming ever more proficient at this stuff and used to dealing with quite large, complex information and making assumptions about it. But we need to help them to make assumptions that are going to be valid for their own life experience. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, the idea of having patients or members of the public help with recruitment is, uh, is, is a very uh, interesting idea. 
My question is about the ethical considerations with, with broader use of that strategy. I think researchers are pretty well aware of the potential for coercion and how to manage it when, uh, when it's a health professional. Do you have any tips for us about uh, how to avoid that, the ethical issues related to having broader use of members of the public doing that? Yeah, so um, uh, and perhaps um, after the meeting I can make sure that you get a contact here because it, I know of one place in England, Birmingham, where, where they've been using patients as recruiters, you know, actually people to go and speak to other patients to recruit to a trial. And that was a very big consideration for them. And so what they did was give people very quite formal um, training as part of that. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that in terms of that recruitment, um, um, part of that dog, they're not the ones who see them sign on the dotted line. That has to be with a clinician. But they are out there spreading the word and spreading the message. But they did get very strong training and support beforehand. But it's also proved to be very, very successful. Because as patients, we do listen to other patients very closely, and we're very persuaded by them, as you rightly point out. Uh, I think we'll close the questions there, and I'd ask you to join me in thanking Simon for okay. his uh, talk today. Thank you.